All right, welcome to the Trap House, everybody. My name's Justin Jett, and this is episode five. It's kind of hard to believe we've kind of been running through these pretty quick, actually. Um, with that being said, I just want to remind everyone that there is no time length or frame on these. Um, if I had to guess, we're probably going to release two or three a month. Uh, just kind of depends on what's going on in the industry or what events might be coming up or who I'm hanging around with, that sort of thing. So just keep that in mind, and uh, I'll update everyone on our Facebook page, Trap House Podcast. So if you haven't liked that page yet, jump on there for me and uh, hit the like button, and I'll keep everyone informed on uh, what's going on. But uh, for today's episode, episode five, we are with Mike Huber and Charlie Mashek of Hoosier Trapper. Uh, Mike is kind of under the radar as far as um, social media butterflies as you <laughs> if you will um he's he doesn't have facebook so you're not going to see his you know catches and things on the group chats and that sort of thing um he's kind of old school he's still got the flip phone sort of deal he doesn't do much online but he is one heck of a trapper uh me and charlie sit down hanging out with him while he's uh cooking um fixing up some maple syrup he's got a bunch of trees tapped we're talking about that and uh his trapping journeys out to Kansas and around home here in Indiana. So uh, that's coming up on this episode. But uh, before we get started, i got to give a big shout out to our sponsors of this show, HoosierTrapperSupply.com. Uh, the one that started it all really for me. So got to give it up for Hoosier Trapper. It's your one-stop shop to pretty much get anything and everything you need to get going on the trap line. And uh, you can visit us online. Or uh, visit us in the store. We're located in central Indiana, just just a few miles off the interstate. So if you're ever driving through the uh, crossroads of America, just pull off, pull off and uh, come say hi. We got a we do taxidermy here too. So there's a showroom, and it's a constantly changing on depending on what kind of work we're doing. So it's pretty cool just to check out and see, and just come by and hang out for a little bit. But uh, so big shout out to Hoosier Trapper. And um, the next sponsor we have is a new one, J3 Outdoors, um, maker of the Hags Bracket, the Hags Bracket and the Spring Clip, the Hags Spring Clip XL, and also the bait holders um, made by Hags as well. And you can get that uh, from Hoosier Trapper or him directly at uh, j3o.com. That stands for J3 Outdoors. It's the number three and not three spelled out. And outdoors is actually with a Z and not an S. But either way, if you punch it in Google, I'm sure it will pop up. So um, before we go any further, though, I do want to talk about his products a little bit in depth here. Because they're awesome. I don't know how else to say it. But uh, this Hags Bracket and the Spring Clips... If you're a marsh trapper, it's a must-have in the marsh. That's how I'm going to say it. you you got to have it. It just makes things so much easier. We all know when you get out in the water and you're in the muck and you can't find certain things to attach to and, you know, to stabilize, um, this is the ticket for all of it. It's so universal. It's a multi-use trap stabilizer, stake swivel, slide lock, all in one. The bracket provides all that. It's it's uh, pretty handy. And the cool thing about it is once you have it attached to your trap at the end of the chain, that, that's it. You don't have to worry about forgetting it in the truck or um, losing it or anything like that. It It's on there and you're good to go. Um, just a great way to fasten the trap in so many different um, situations. And uh, same thing with the spring clips, the two the two different ones he has there. One, the XL is bigger for like the 220 and 330 size, and then, you know, stabilizes on a piece of rebar, half-inch rebar. Something, you know, sturdy and heavy to hold, hold that trap up. 
and uh, the the regular spring clip is for 160 body grips and down and that works well on your smooth rod situations uh, like 3 8 size and uh, I tell you what the one out of all those my favorite thing is is that spring clip because you ever get to that spot and there's a, a rat den that's just a little too far out and or it's before work and you don't have full waders on you just have some boots on or something you can't really get out there to where you need to get go ahead and slide that clip on and it's in your springs once it's there it's there you don't ever have to mess with it again slide it on your rod adjust whatever depth that you think you need and just reach out there and plug it in the mud right in front of that hole that den entry and bam that is it it's so slick man i tell you um so definitely check all his stuff out j3 outdoors he has a facebook page uh jeff haggerty's the man he's uh he he's gonna i've talked to him here recently he, he's gonna be on the show at some point and we can talk about these maybe in a little bit more detail or in depth and also about some of his trapping journeys he recently was in alaska and that sounded like a pretty cool little deal to chat about but um yeah i know it's hard to picture all this with me talking about it but to visualize it all on his website and things um that's where you can really see what's going on and there's a bunch of videos online too including the ones that we've shown on our hoosier trapper outdoors when we gone uh muskrat trapping in the marsh uh we use some hags bracket setups and things like that so definitely check his stuff out and then if you're in the convention deal if you're at the national conventions i know they bounce around to some other ones um they're out of michigan but they hit numerous conventions their display booth is really nice and he's got numerous situations and setups to visually show you you can ask him directly any question and he's going to have your answer right then and there and so can't thank you enough jeff j3 outdoors and who's your trapper supply.com all right we're hanging out making maple syrup with mike huber today it's quite the setup uh, this is one of those where i wish we had a video camera to show you guys <laughs> yeah it's pretty neat we um so so mike it, and i will get to all that but mike mike's uh, obviously a uh, trapper and and um one of those guys that's uh not real well known but uh makes catches that are up there with anybody out as good as anybody out there so um uh, but we'll we'll get to all that so mike you're you're on your syrup here how much how much syrup are you boiling a day oh i'm boiling probably right now 300 gallons 300 gallons yeah. yeah sap i should say yeah. yeah yeah and probably made about 60 gallons here in the last three or four weeks and so depending on how much on the weather roughly how much longer do you think you you'll go just depends on the weather if it freezes and and gets sunny every day till july i can make it till july <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to once it warms up then the sap kind of quits yeah and it's just got to be cold at night you know like 25 28 and then 45 and sunny in the daytime and it'll run yeah yeah or i guess when i run out of wood because <laughs> it's fired by wood so <laughs> okay okay yeah, it's quite the a little bit different setup than last time I was here. We usually come up. Charlie sends me up here to Mike's to pick up coyote urine or carcasses or anything for using bait and things like that. So I'm always checking in on his current projects. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Speak, Sp- speaking of that, yeah. Speaking I, of urine, um, um, Mike Mike collects uh, coyote urine, and we 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 buy a. Uh, uh, a lot of coyote urine from Mike and, and um, there was, there was one really bad experience up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You remember that Mike? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How could you forget? Uh, what was that a year or two years ago? I don't know. Two or three years ago. Two I'm or trying, three years trying ago. to forget about it. We'll go ahead and tell the story and get this over with. I didn't want this public because I'm know I'm going to get made fun of. Oh, it's public. I've told a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I've caught a lot of coyotes at that spot too. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what happened is come up here and got, I don't know, twenty five five gallon buckets of coyote urine, I think, or yeah, roughly, and uh, load the truck up and 
at that point just sitting around talking not really paying attention trading stories mike's telling me about his current uh or his current trip that he took out to kansas and things like that and then just pulled out of the driveway with the tailgate not all the way latched it was like partially it it wasn't locked all the way because we had probably too many buckets in there and i make it up and down the road's kind of rocky and up and down and surprised how far i made it but just to where the road gets busy you got to pull out and make a left hand turn there's kind of traffic going so i uh, kind of gassed it a little bit turned the corner and then the gate the tailgate fell down and buckets of urine flying across the road <laughs> <laughs> and it reeked charlie had, that truck was pretty new to you right when, yeah yeah <laughs> so there was urine everywhere uh a couple cars stopped and they're like oh let me help you let me help you i'm like i don't know if you want to man i don't know if you have the right gear for this job you might need a hazmat suit or some rubber boots one of them sure enough he he didn't care he helped he had it all over him by the time he was done <laughs> i appreciate the help we got salvaged some that was you know some of the buckets were cracked so you could still had urine in those but we lost several gallons, and I was afraid to call Charlie because luckily I'm married to his daughter, so he couldn't, like, fire me because I was just caused too many family issues. So so uh, he actually took it quite well. He's like, it's okay. Things happen. It kind of reminds <laughs> like, me of the time. this nice all the time? I was, I was fleshing skunks, and a couple of buddies came in to see what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, – so I'm just flushing these skunks. Oh, boy, it stinks in here. Yeah, I, they stayed for 10 or 15 minutes. Well, we got to go. We're going to a birthday party. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so they said later on, they said they didn't last long at the birthday party. I imagine not. I mean, they didn't touch anything, but just in the air, it just, it it just only takes a micro drop to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that stuff permeates you, and the thing is, you don't realize that it does until you go somewhere else and somebody says, man, you smell like a skunk. Yep. So, yeah, I've been bad. to come to, went to drive up at McDonald's or something after catching a skunk or something. Yeah. The girl was say, oh, I smell a skunk. I said, yeah, I just hit one on the road back there. <laughs> <laughs> I went to uh, uh, check my line one morning before school, college, downtown Indianapolis, you know, and... Uh, I get to school as a math class as soon as I walked in that door. I caught a skunk that morning, but I stayed downwind, tried to do all the right things. Didn't matter. Did not matter. <laughs> that classroom was just complaining. I had to leave. I just went home <laughs> that day, took a shower. <laughs> Good times. Yeah. Well, and see, as trappers, we actually kind of, I actually kind of appreciate that smell. I don't have any problem with it. So, you know, but. It's uh, driving down the road and you smell a skunk. It just smells like good times. Oh, yeah. Know, so. Yeah, it brings back memories. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, Mike, why don't you tell us kind of where you got the trapping bug and how you got started, if it was someone showed you or a relative or family member, or how did you, you get into all this? Well, I was probably 12 or 13, and my dad was a farm manager for a Purdue University experimental farm about two miles from where we're at right now. And one of the hired men trapped. And I remember going out in the morning and he'd come in to work and he had a couple of these long, slender, brown animals with a furry tail laying there in, in his truck. And I said, man, what's that? I said, those are mink. So he started telling me about how he trapped and everything, you know, so that sounds pretty cool, you know. So I think I ended up buying a like a cage trap and caught rabbits and possums and stuff like that and so of course i always wanted to catch something else you know and back then the coon weren't very plentiful you know so i'd end up catching two or three coon a year and then a few muskrats and i think i caught a first fox i caught was maybe a gray fox and so of course you got found fur fish and game and my studies suffered after that because i'd buy back issues to read them <laughs> <laughs> my parents actually had to probably take the fur fish and game and hide them somewhere <laughs> but just kind of years of you know trial and error and fi trying to figure it out and talking to other guys and just, yeah yeah just slowly work yeah. your way up there building and then i and actually quit trapping about 
probably 1977, back when the fur was high, just because so much theft and everybody's out there running around. I deer hunted for about five years, and I was met this guy that was talking about trapping and setting snares and stuff, and so I said, well, I'd like to learn how to do that, you know. So, so that was probably about 86 or so, and so I got kind of back into it then and mm-hmm. hadn't slowed down since then. Yeah. You know, I, and I think in talking to other trappers, too, uh, during those 70s when fur was really high, there were a number of them actually that, that hung it up during that time because it was so really? fr- frustrating with trap thievery and fur thievery and getting permission and yeah. trespassers and... and um, coon hunters. And coon hunters were, yeah, difficult to... Not be, all were bad, be, but, be around. You know. Yeah. That's one thing, too. I always hear the stories of the fur boom and when everybody was out there, you know, and I'm from a younger generation some of that i'm kind of glad is not around you know hearing that portion of it you know it's just almost too many people in the woods at the same time sort of deal i mean there's obviously great things about it when it was happening for sure but there's a lot of crap you'd have to deal with too (laughs) yeah there was a lot of crazy stuff during that time for sure of course 86 that the market was not yeah, you know yeah. that was it was start it was not bad but then of course a couple years later it fell apart completely so i just kept on trapping yeah i didn't didn't slow down much really just I, actually look i think you went into high gear didn't you yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> how now so did you start going to kansas about that time or did you eh, it was probably about 99 okay 98 or 99 okay that i went the first time and was only there for three weeks that time I, I called a guy out there and and uh he said yeah come on out so i had one contact when i got out there but as you well know you know once they find out your trapper there it's oh you can go over here and trap and right Snow so balls. it wasn't you know it was it was hard it just not trapping and trying to get out get permission lined up and but it really didn't wasn't too hard at all to get permission lined up out there. Mm-hmm. Especially at those at the times, it seems like here the past few years, a lot of guys have been running out to Kansas to trap from back east here. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Don't know, I don't know if that's affected you out there or not. I haven't run anybody, any out-of-staters okay. where I'm at. Okay. There's, there's a couple local guys this year that I kind of ran into, found their traps. And, mm-hmm. But other than that, I mean, I showed a, uh, one of the ranchers – kids was just like eight years old when i got there and he ran around with me and kind of they set some traps and caught a few bobcats and stuff and he actually went and they have trapping in 4-h mm-hmm. out there mm-hmm. so he won like with his exhibit and his display he won like grand champion oh really of the fair for yeah. his exhibit mm-hmm. so i thought it was pretty cool that is very cool <laughs> so yeah. i trapped even when I was in college and high school and stuff, and mm-hmm. I, uh, one, I was a distance runner, ran cross country and track. Mm-hmm. And in college, our team qualified for the nationals, national cross country meet out in, I think it was Salina, Kansas. And the only bad thing about it was, it was November 15th. <laughs> and I went to the coach, and I said, listen, coach, he says, I can't go. I said, what do you mean? He says, trapping season starts i got a trap and uh so i made an alternate on the team very happy that year <laughs> he got to go instead of me <laughs> that's a dedicated trapper right there <laughs> so the coach didn't have a super big issue with that evidently no yeah. i mean we weren't going to win anything but oh, okay. still we qualified right so, right um and i wasn't you know like the number one top runner or anything like that but i was on the team and uh-huh so I tell people that, and I think it's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> the coach never did really figure it out. He, he didn't get it. No. <laughs> like, okay, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so that kind of reminds me when I was first trapping, and we were uh, like a freshman or sophomore, and the kid that trapped with me at the time, and who I started with, played basketball too. Well, I didn't play school sports. So, you know, and, and we'd get up at, four or five in the morning check traps before school and then but then he'd go have a game or practice after school is this when you were 
checking traps on a bicycle? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah, it's before I was driving, and his parents said you got to give up one or the other because you, you're acting like you're half asleep when you're playing basketball. Of course, they were pushing that he drop the trap and not, not and continue to play basketball. So he he did drop the trap and and, and went and played basketball and and never, as far as I know, never came back to trapping. But I'm still trapping all these years later, and I know he isn't playing basketball. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, I don't think he even finished out his uh, high school years in in basketball. So, I kind of look at that. It's like, it's 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 nice to have an interest that you can stick with for the rest of your life. Yeah, versus, I got a, you know, I got a buddy that we talk probably every, every day during trapping season, Don Hauser. Oh yeah. And uh, he just lives about ten miles from me, but. He's been trapping. I think he said he had every trapping license he ever bought. Really? And he's been trapping since he was probably 15 or. And, yeah. Uh, so he's, I think he's 70, 77 now. Oh, really? So I said, how long, much longer are you going to trap? He said, oh, as long as I can keep trapping. <laughs> That's right. I said, man, <laughs> says, you're 10 years older than me. That means I got to keep trapping at least till you quit. <laughs> so, I can't have you trapping more years than I do. Yeah. I think it's one of those things, as long as you're physically able, it's just good for you to keep going and, you know, keep doing it. I'm a little bit behind you, but uh, not a lot. So I'm getting, some, I'm getting some arthritis in my fingers. Yeah. When I get back from Kansas, my knuckles are all swollen up. And so I guess I don't know what I'm going to do when I can't skin anymore. Yeah. Well, you'll just hire somebody to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been going out to Kansas 20 years, you said? Yes. Man, that's. Have you been to any other states, or that's kind of you got there, fell in love with it, and just stuck with it? No, that's that's about it. I I was at a friend's place in North Carolina, and we went and caught some beavers out of a guy's pond. That's that's really the extent of it. Is out of state, but yeah. But now you you trap very hard here in Indiana too. Prior to going yes. to yeah um, Kansas. Now were you always kind of a coyote? I, I remember I actually used to catch a well you still do but you used to catch a bunch of raccoons yeah yeah i uh i trapped raccoons from probably like 80 87 to whenever the price dropped on them a couple years a few mm-hmm. years ago pretty hard you know you know i'd catch any on an off year i'd catch a couple hundred and but then when the prices were decent i'd catch you know 900 to 1200 that's a lot of raccoons that was no dog proof all 220s yeah so I, I thought to myself man if i'd have had dog proof back then because you you pass by so many places that you could catch a coon in a dog proof like nothing mm-hmm. so i was always just looking for the perfect spot for 220s mm-hmm. so you know there's i don't know how many i would have caught if i had dog proof then so was that was that the you'd run that the entire season or just a month or like how would you um the year i did really really well it was it was warm the whole season but yeah. just a, maybe a few days where it was down in the, too cold for him to run so i remember i don't at yet year that i did so well i don't think i set any traps till like november 20th because we had a bunch of snow early cold weather early yeah and so but it was uh I don't know if I'd ever do that again. It was, that's a lot of work. Was that the year you caught the 1,200? Yeah. Did you skin all those two then, or did you have somebody I helping you? S- I had a kid help me skin, and uh, we would had it set up so it was pretty much of a production line skinning, you know. And Right. Um, so we'd, some of them, I fleshed almost all of them, but then I Terry Manley fleshed maybe 300 for me mm-hmm. just because I guess ran out of freezer space. You'd run. Nah. The um, um, now when you're trapping coon like that, you're not catching. You're not trapping anything else. You're no, not, you're. I mean, that's just, just it. Possums, just you know, yeah. Possums and Target coons. the main thing right. that right. you're after. Nope. I would trap coyotes beginning October fifteenth. Mm-hmm. Then I'd trap for about three weeks and then get ready for coon. You know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was kind of. You know, my time started at October 15th and all the way to, you know, the end of January if I mm-hmm. went out to Kansas. And mm-hmm. Sometimes I stayed. Kansas season ended in or February 15th. 
So I think I only stayed out there to the end of the season, maybe one or two times. Which is February. February 15th. Yeah. 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 It's, it, I, I suppose at that point it's like you've had enough maybe. And at the first yeah, night. Yeah, and the then I was night. just mainly trapping cats out there because the coyotes are just full of mange and they weren't worth anything. So I was just trying to catch as many bobcats as I could. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, their fur actually was, you know, from the middle of January to the middle of February was at their prime, you know. Right. They were really, really nice fur animals then. And the coyotes were, went downhill and the coons were downhill. And mm-hmm. so, so I was just mainly trapping for cats. And there was a lot of cats out there right then because mm-hmm. you could drive down the road in the morning before daylight. And in a mile stretch of road, you might see 10 cottontails mm-hmm. running across. So they were just everywhere. Yeah. So are they, are they st- cycle? Is the cycle down on them out the, there right now, or is it starting to I come back? I probably didn't see this year. Probably didn't see twenty rabbits the whole time I was oh, there. Oh really? So hmm. what kind of sets normally? Are you doing traditional dirt hole stuff? Or are you uh, back when I was making you know pretty good catches on cats? I was mainly just dirt holes at gate openings into the fields or in the shelter belts mm-hmm. just a dirt hole with bait and a bunch of feathers now i've been mainly using walkthrough sets okay and narrowing the, their walkthroughs down you know to where they just got one place to step mm-hmm. and of course you always catch a lot of of uh bobcats and coyote sets too just because they're out there right right Well, we, we kind of jump around with our sets, too, but since we're kind of multi-species catch, trapping, it's nine times out of ten dirt holes. But yeah, it's fun to just target cats. It really is. Yeah. It's a whole nother game. <laughs> the one, the ones where that always gets me is where you got a cat set specifically, and it's up in the brush, and it's someplace that you, would, you wouldn't you right. would think you'd catch anything but a cat, and you will be a coyote sitting yep. in it. Yep. I've He'd caught them in some pretty narrow down spots. Yeah. Feathers hanging around, everything. Yeah. <laughs> All the blocking in the world. Yeah. And <laughs> coyotes still get in there. Of course, your problem out there is so many coons. Mm-hmm. And so I got to where I would set dog proof traps on either side of the cat set to try to, you know, get the coon before he got and messed up a set that takes you five minutes to remake. Right, right. And, but, you know, I didn't. That worked part of the time, but more than likely the coon's going to be in the, in the all your blocking and stuff. Everything tore up in a big pile. Right. Of course, with cats, that just makes it better for the next cat that comes along because he likes. They're, they're interested in all that stuff with the smells and everything. All that disturbance. And yeah. Yeah. The good eye appeal. Right. So, so do you make what they call the, then just push everything up in the trash pile and just work off of that then? And yeah. I mean, I'll cut down. Or drag trees up and just make narrow a, a 20 foot wide place in the brush where I know they're going to be and uh, crowd everything up to like a, a foot diameter and then block block it all in and mm-hmm. and uh, I use uh, sphagnum dried sphagnum peat moss on about almost all my sets because mm-hmm. it's it just goes off the trap goes off no matter what you know. Mm-hmm. And then I usually put, uh, I take some wax dirt, and that's what I kind of put on top of the the peat moss. And then you don't have to worry about your peat moss blowing away. Right. And uh, you use anything else, salt or calcium chloride or anything, nope. or just strictly the peat moss nope. and the... Peat moss and wax dirt. Yeah. That's that's a good idea on the wax dirt, because it's hard to get enough of that made if you're going to... Yeah, and it didn't, it didn't take but a, a handful right. to, to just keep from blowing away. And uh, plus that lo- that makes a little look a little more natural too. Be but I use it, I use that on my coyote sets and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, probably wouldn't have to, but you never you, you know it's in Indiana anyway. It's going to rain sometime. Most and, of the uh, most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so with the peat moss, I mean that track can be underwater, and you set it off, and the peat moss will float to the top dry. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I, even in October when it's sunny and dry, I make everything with peat moss. Yeah. Because then I don't have to mess with the trap anymore. Right. So it makes a catch. Right. 
but it, the nice thing about that is it can rain three inches on it, and that peat moss won't collapse like dirt will. Mm -hmm. It'll look just, just like you made it mm -hmm. when you first made it. Huh. So here in Indiana, when you, you, you say you trap the coyotes three or four weeks, are you moving locations, or are you just setting up and just staying in one spot then? or? No, I've got – I'll move maybe every 10 days. Okay. Try to get some new areas, and I'll leave some spots set just because they go by them or something. Mm -hmm. just, you're just stubborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, I ought to catch a coyote there. Yeah. <laughs> and more than likely, the well, I'm going to pull that trap today, and you go back there, and there's a coyote in it. Yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. So then you leaving it then, or are you pulling it? I pull it. Pull it. Yep. <laughs> pull it, definitely. <laughs> But, I mean, there's something to be said about just leaving traps in the ground. Because if you're on, you know, a good location, right. like a waterway or something, right. sooner or later there's going to be a coyote there, as many coyotes as there are around here. Yeah. But you always want to try to find some new ground. And, you know, grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah. So. I think that's key as far as making cons continuous, consistent sets is just, getting new new ground set up yeah and, you know i mean it's a lot of work right to pull everything up and relocate everything and and uh but yeah now do you do you when you pull up and you move to a new location are you cleaning traps or are you not reusing traps that make catches or are you just resetting them anyways i'm just resetting them resetting them yeah i don't the only time i clean a trap if it's just clogged with mud mm -hmm. and i'm i need some traps you know i'll bring the all the ones that are all mud balls and bring it back and hit them with a pressure washer but i don't re-wax them or anything I mm -hmm. just, just can't it's too much it takes too much you're time. there yeah you're there limited time you got to work with i probably got pay the price for it sometimes you know you get something digging at your trap but just set it and go on yeah how, how many years have you been out to kansas charlie we just we went four years four okay years, four years in a row was all so but uh think about going back someday so i don't know we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> after the past couple years in new mexico we're look we're definitely looking for something else so but um yeah we'll, we'll see what happens but uh well i remember seeing the pictures you had caught good cats out there and jake always looked like he was having fun yeah yeah except for the day you told me you caught like 30 possums in one day the weather was just right they run in oh, that it was rain terrible do you catch a bunch of possums in kansas not where I'm at. Okay. I mean, I get a few, but not like <laughs> some guys tell me. Yeah, there was one year. I don't remember what I don't remember what we caught for the time we were there, but we caught 27 possums in one day. Oh my gosh! But the next year <laughs> when we went, we didn't catch hardly any. So I think we I think we wiped them. I mean, we were pretty hard on them. So yeah. <laughs> and we were we were trapping ground that was um, uh, bird hunting ground uh, an outfitter had all this ground leased up and we were actually trapping under him uh -huh. you know for him and so he wanted everything that would could eat a quail egg yeah dead cleared know, out so, of there yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but th yeah i'll never forget that day with all those possums that, that you talk about a bunch of remakes it probably rained too didn't it <laughs> uh, that's the worst it, thing it actually it didn't but yeah <laughs> it felt like catching one of that. the only thing that makes catching a possum worse is when it rained that night yeah yeah yeah, that's yeah, that that is for sure. We we were just looking at all your fur that you had hanging up in the in your fur shed, and you were talking about your coyotes. So you're still using wire on coyotes. Yes. Which is what we, what I do as yes. well. So have you? I've got wooden, I've got wooden forms that I use on cats that they got a wire nose to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I'll put them on them, but I found out that because I stretch them uh, fur out from the very beginning because mm. I borax them. Mm -hmm. But I found out that that's the hide that's up next to the wood doesn't dry. Right. So I just went to all wire. What about on the cats then? Are, is that edge drying on the on the cats then okay or is it staying? Yeah, I just make sure I got lots of air blowing on them. Okay. And uh, so they're borax too, of course. Mm -hmm. So I just make sure I got lots of air blowing on them. Okay. And some heat, you know. Just leave, you just have to leave them on a little bit longer. Sometimes I'll, I will, uh, after they've been on a week, I'll pull them off and get another stretcher that's the wood is dry and put them back on. Okay. It's a different stretcher so the wood's not saturated with that moisture. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
just let them continue drying like that. Mm -hmm. but, and then you're actually you're taking fans and shooting it up up underneath the right. skin. The fan yeah. is set horizontal on a on the top of the freezer, and then the hides are hanging up above. Uh, you know, if there's probably a foot or so space between the bottom of the hide and the and the fan that's blowing it, and it blows up right in inside the hide. And right. It uh, dries pretty good that way. Which I mean, that's uh, just the more crude method of how they do. Um, um, uh, ranch fox, ranch and stuff fox, and mink. ranch mink, because they got the the um, hoses with the air going directly up in yeah. the stretchers and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. And you just cut the ears completely off. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tell people that all the time, and it just bothers people to say, you know, because they want to pull the cartilage, but they're having they're struggling with that. And of course, then they rip, half the time you rip the ear anyways. It's like, well, just yeah, cut, just I cut just the ear off. Take it well, before I put it on the stretcher. I mean, actually, actually, when I get it on the stretcher. Because they're fur out, I just take a sharp knife and just cut the ear clear off, clear yeah. at the base, and then that that hole there's a pretty good hole there, but it kind of when it dries, it just shrinks up to where you can't hardly notice it. And I've had told people, look at those coyotes. Will you see anything different about them? And they look at them and said, no. I mean, yeah. there's no ears. Oh, I see that. Yeah, I mean, just to see them hanging in there, you would think, oh, maybe their ears are. If you even notice, you think, well, maybe the ears are folded down or pushed in or yeah. or whatever. But yeah. I used to take them, like, pin them out flat toward the nose, you know, but it just takes long for those ears to dry. Right. If you don't get a lot of the cartilage out. But. I've never cut mine off. I think I might try it next year. It, they're just more more prone to tainting, smelling right. bad, rotten, and then that's just a red flag to whoever's grading them. And, right. And, um, uh, yep, that fur put up is important on those prices. So did you ever did you ever trap any muskrats back five or six years ago when they got so high, or did you just stick with the other stuff? Oh, I caught some out of my pond, and but I didn't I didn't go after them at all. Yeah. You know, coons are bringing good money then, so. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 I didn't you feel like putting on hip boots, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in Indiana, it's it's um, sad to say. You could go catch more coons now than you can muskrats. Right. I mean, we just don't have them anymore. I mean, when I was in college and high school, you know, I was catching, you know, hundred to three hundred in a year. Right. Every little, every little mud puddle had a muskrat house on it. Right. And you just, yeah, I don't know what happened to them all. Yeah, it's it's a we've we've talked about this before. It's it's odd what they've just just disappeared and it happened after the prices went down on them i mean it, you know when the prices were high back in the 70s and 80s year in year out we caught and produced tons of muskrats and then once the market went away now we don't have them anymore right you know so wasn't over trapping was it it sure wasn't <laughs> no no because if they if they survived i remember it i think it was the late 70s early 80s and they hit seven or eight bucks on the carcass or some crazy thing and they survive that. They can survive yeah. just about anything. So, uh, guys were trapping. There was—I don't think there was any area in the state that didn't get untrapped or right. not trapped. Just everybody was out beating the bushes, you know. So, but uh, huh. ever ever you ever run into any lions out there in Kansas? Nope. I saw what I think was a track one time, but never have, you know caught any or seen any mm -hmm. i mean you hear all the stories you know right usually the guy was drunk or something <laughs> <laughs> i mean we hear those stories here in indiana about yeah. <laughs> you mean he wasn't reliable <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple run-ins in new mexico but did you still yeah, we, haven't connected did we've you come see him no not, uh just visits at the set oh okay it they, where we were the one of the trips with the third trip that we took out there it was more deep forest type big woods yeah and uh in there you could tell it just looked like a better habitat and then they for what i mean most of our visits were after we caught a gray fox so that must huh. be a big part of their diet and definitely interested we even had a fox kind of was destroyed and tore up and ripped out of the trap yeah and jake had found tracks in the wash and i actually had one flip off uh, on a and there was a cat track in the wash so you know and you're running smaller stuff for coyotes and yeah. bobcat so i mean 
trap's not an ideal size, but I'm, I'm sure if it, he could get in it, it'd hold him. So yeah, I, I use all MB 550s, and I I know if a mountain lion got his foot in one of those, who got two or three toes caught, it'd hold him. Oh yeah, yep. that's what we use that's too. What, yeah, yeah, primarily. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's, that's what a good we trap. Use. So when here in Indiana, Mike, on your coyote sets, are you running primarily dirt holes then, or or yeah, flat almost, sets too? Yeah, almost a hundred percent. Yeah. Now you told me one year you caught here in Indiana around your house like a ten mile radius. You had like a hundred and something coyotes. Does that sound about right? Oh, that was that was probably a probably twelve or fifteen mile radius. 12, 15 you know, mile radius, yeah. catching 100 plus coyotes. Yeah. And how, what kind of time span? Just, uh, it was like, I don't three, think, three weeks. I was going to say, I don't weeks. remember it being too yeah. terribly long because you no, had switched gears from yeah, I mean, chasing was, coon to that or back and forth. I think it was a, a real dry year, so I could drive around about everywhere. And I got my truck rigged up where I haul a four wheeler because I don't think you can be a serious coyote trapper in Indiana without a four wheeler. Mm hmm. Cause you just, you yeah, know. you can't be efficient. Yeah, unless you, you, that way you don't make the farmers mad by rutting up their fields. And right. Yeah, you'll only get permission there once if you do that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So. So in Kansas, um, kind of jumping back and forth, but talking about property, you've added to that over these years. I'm guessing. Oh yeah, I always get. I get more every year. I mean, yeah. I didn't even. There was many, many ranches I didn't even trap this year to just couldn't get to it all. Yeah. yeah. Do you know ballpark what the number of fakers, or, or you just go nah. enough to enough to you work know, with? Probably a <laughs> couple hundred thousand acres I could go on. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's hopefully uh, me and Charlie can round up that much around home <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening to this and you're in the johnson county area <laughs> we're more than welcome to come catch some coyotes <laughs> so how are yeah you got to check your maple syrup here yeah i better check it I'm gonna throw some wood on throw some heat it's a pretty cool process i'll i'm probably gonna get one of these pint size from you before we leave he used <laughs> yeah mike's putting some wood on the fire right now he uses uh small pieces of wood to make a hotter fire so but it burned it requires a lot of it burn down attention so we'll let mike take care of this fire real quick then we'll get back with everybody <laughs> All right, we're back. He's got it blazing hot now. Woo! <laughs> Fire is going. How many gallons of uh, sap did you say again? Well, it takes roughly, as a rule of thumb, 40 gallons of sap from the tree to make one gallon of syrup. Yeah. So I made about 60 gallons so far. So I've collected, you know, 24, 2,500 gallons of sap. I got more out in the woods. I got a good collect when we're done here. <laughs> so and then and you can and you cook about three hundred gallons of sap a day. That's what runs through here. Ah, uh, that's that'd be a big day. Okay. Yeah. We started started out as a kid because my dad made it when he was a kid. Okay. So we had a couple of maple trees on the farm. So dad thought to show the kids how it was done. You know. So we cooked it on the kitchen stove in the kitchen mm -hmm. and about made all the wallpaper curl <laughs> off the walls <laughs> so then we did it out in the garage on a little gas burner and then ended up making a little camp back in the woods with a big butchering kettle mm -hmm. and just kind of over the year just kind of improved and progressed a little bit so mm -hmm. um so it's something that you've always done yeah okay yep okay and you know here i don't I don't know, the last 10 or 15 years, it seems like it's really become quite popular here in Indiana for people to cook syrup. I don't know is, if, that, if, that's, if that's just my observation or if, it's, if that seems the case. I, I don't mean, know. I mean, it just seems like there's more people talking about it and doing it, and, and maybe it's just because I'm paying more attention to it. I don't know. But, um, uh, so, Mike, you go out, you go out in, here in Indiana and, and the, all the coyotes that you catch, 
they all go in a cage for urine collection. Yeah, I collect urine on them until I get ready to, you know, a week or so before I go to Kansas, and I gotta go out and kill sixty coyotes and skin them and put them up. So, kind of that's kind of a two-way deal because you're you're gaining primeness on the skins. Right. You know, October fifteenth, there's not a very coyotes don't look very good here at all. But right by second week in November, they're starting to look halfway decent. And right. So. Especially the the pups caught that earlier really right. bad. So. And there's something to be said about skinning a a freshly killed coyote versus one that's been laying around for a day or two. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a big hog operation about two miles from here, and they'll have maybe four or five feed sacks full of dead baby pigs every day. So I go over there beginning about the first of September, and I fill all my freezers full of pigs. And then as I'm filling the cages up, I'll feed them, and then I go over and get fresh ones. And then I get to the point where feeding 65 coyotes you can't hardly keep up because, you know, I give them all they can eat and right. there's hardly ever anything left in the cage with because I put four or five together and you throw th- six or eight pigs in there and they're gone. Mm-hmm. And they'll start, it's amazing, they can chew up the rock hard frozen pig right away. They just start chewing on it and they just, <laughs> they just chew it up. Yeah, that's, that's some incredible jaw strength right there to, yeah. to think about. Yeah. You couldn't afford to feed them dog food. <laughs> no, no. And deer, I could get roadkill deer, but then you got to skin them and cut. I mean, then you, it's just a mess. Right. right. It's so much easier just to throw a pig sickle in there for them. Are you, they get the whole pig. It's not gutted or anything. No, they everything. just eat the whole thing. Yeah, that way get they're getting more of a complete diet yeah. with the intestinal. Well, some of them are even, you know, premature. Mm-hmm. And then some of them could be 10 pounders. Okay. Okay. So, but, you know, most of them are in the, you know, one to five pound range probably. Mm-hmm. Which makes it more convenient to oh, handle. It's very, yeah, it's very easy. Yeah, pick them up and throw them in there. So on the urine, do you then do you collect every day and strain every day? Or yeah. 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 I got buckets and they're like rain gutters. And mm-hmm. I got big barrels that I put a filter in the top and big funnel and just dump it all in there. Mm-hmm. And it's... it's Especially if it sets for, you know, six months. Everything's settled to the bottom. Right. And it's just pure, clean, clean urine. And then the, the, the sludge at the bottom is actually pretty good stuff, too. Right. Probably even better than the urine because right. it's got other stuff in it. And yeah. yeah. They talk about, you know, freezing urine and then what the watery stuff on the top that freezes hard, throw that away. And then what's the in the bottom all the natural salts and all the sediment and all that yeah. and then to keep that as a, right. like a real intense urine you know i don't know if anybody goes through the drill uh, pers- you know i mean i've i've have cans for water for my coyotes mm-hmm. but very rarely when i would put water in there they drink it really they're getting so much moisture out of the pig it's 90 percent water anyway mm-hmm. the only reason i do it i guess is because you know i can sell some but then I can keep the coyotes, I can trap longer. Right. Because I can, instead of starting middle of November, I can ch- start right at the beginning of the season. Right. And not feel too bad. I mean, they don't bring, at least Indiana coyotes don't bring big money anyway, but, you know, at least I can trap. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yep, keeps you going. I got, I, I uh, uh, you normally make a, Arounds to the National Trappers Convention or, or Fur Takers Convention, I think, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Come out, come with uh, uh, Don Hauser. Don, a lot of times, or, yeah. yeah. I've got a buddy in Iowa that usually has a camper there. I stay with him. Oh, okay, okay. He's a, he's, a, he's a real good trapper. He's gun ho about it, bad as I am, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's actually been up into Alaska with a buddy his camping at 40 below zero. Really? Trapping lynx and... Pine Martins. <laughs> <laughs> that 40 below, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah, brutal. that's brutal. That's the nice thing about going to Kansas or the southwest or the south is you can avoid that extreme right. cold. Extreme cold. As the, but, and the older I get, I, don't, I have less appreciation for extreme cold. But, uh, 
Um, yeah, it's no fun trying to make a dirt hole set when the ground's frozen six, eight inches deep. Yeah, yeah. So what do you what do you, what do you do when it's like that? Um. Well, if I got some places to snares, I'll set snares. But uh, I just take a I always take a pick with me, mm -hmm. and you can you can make, spend a little bit of time, and you can chop out a trap bed. Mm -hmm. Then you line it with peat moss, and then take the sharp end of the pick and drive it into the ground about where you want your hole and smear some bait down in there and uh you know eventually it thaws out mm -hmm. but when i i tried something a little different this year on just a few sets and this don hauser buddy of mine was playing around with this they call it this pipe dream set mm -hmm. and uh, i've seen that out he, uh, mark, uh, mark zager yeah he was kind of hey yeah i think this is a pretty good thing you know so I said, well, I don't have any pipes out here, but I got some dog-proof traps. <laughs> so I, I made this pipe dream set with a dog-proof trap. And, uh, and I caught coyotes with it. Mm -hmm. I just bedded the trap normally. I didn't go to, you know, doing what that this mark did. But I was thinking, well, I'll just bait the dog-proof trap, which I put coyote bait in it. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw some coon bait in the bottom of it and put coyote bait on top of it. And if the coon comes along and happens to get caught in the coyote trap, he's going to fiddle around there and, and eventually he's going to get caught in the dog proof trap too. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have him. He won't get away. Right. And he's going to tear the set up anyway. Right. So at least you got well, a coon. But I may, I may try that a little more this year and just, just to kind of see what happens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it it worked well for you then for on yeah, the coyotes. Yeah, I think I caught three coyotes, and I just made a few sets with it. You know, mm -hmm. but they would they would definitely because I've had coyotes check out dog proof traps that were set in the snow. You know, right. So it's not not like they're getting they're scared of them or anything. Right. But you can never catch one in it. Mm -hmm. but I have caught a I've caught one red fox in a dog proof trap, mm -hmm. which I know other guys have too. Mm -hmm. I think I think. It's hard for people to, to get in their mind about all the stuff that coyotes run into in the course of a day as far as all the metal things and all the right. rusty stuff that's out there. And, you know, and it's, it's not a big deal to have, have that dog proof there. It's not, you know, it's no, not going to huh. shine away, you know, so. But, uh, yeah, leftover farm equipment laying around. And we d we've trapped some place in Kansas where I think, you know, when the farm equipment quit working, that that's where it stayed. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> setting all over the prairie yep. out there in, in certain areas, certain ranches. But anyways. Well, Mike? what do you think? Wrap it up? Yep. Well, it's nice chatting with you. Well, Appreciate it. I'm glad you're going to come down and do another demo in September for us. Yeah, sure. You got anything you want to wrap this up with, Mike? Well. Come to a self-serving maple <laughs> shop here. <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep busy doing something all your life, I guess. Yeah, I think that's key. So I'm getting ready to go down. I ride a road bike all summer long, getting ready to go down to Tennessee in a couple of weeks with a bunch of buddies of mine. We ride up around Gatlinburg in the Smoky Mountains, up and down mountains for about four days. And You're not talking about a motorcycle. You're talking no, we're talking yeah. about a pedal bike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of my other hobby. and. Like, I golf and ride my bike and fish during the summer. And yeah, yeah. Dream about trapping season. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do one concluder on Mike. I was getting ready to do a demo at the NTA convention in, in Illinois, and, and um, Mike walks in to see what was going on. I said, man, the, I'm, I'm – I'm I'm not the one that should be doing the demo here, Mike. It should be you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still learning. Yeah, that you know that's the thing. There's always something to learn and improve on and find new, more efficient ways. And so um, I'm always anxious to talk to Mike because he's usually got some idea of something new. Yeah, that I he's got a new trying. I got a new thing I've been doing. I'll show it to at the rendezvous. Okay. And, and uh, give you something to think about. Okay. So. All right. We'll see. We'll keep keep everybody on the edge there so you have to come to the rendezvous <laughs> to see what mike's talking about so <laughs> all right all right yep. thanks for hanging out guys we'll uh catch you next time all right appreciate it mike okay thank you bye just wanted to mention one more thing before we left um 
We should probably mention where the rendezvous is taking place. Uh, uh, Mike's going to be doing the demo at. That's um, hosted here at Hoosier Trapper Supply. Uh, it's always the last Saturday in September, September 28th, 2019 this year. Come out, it's a giant day of fun, of trapping, uh, raffles, auction, the whole deal. Uh, but yeah, the last Saturday in September, come come check out Mike's demo. Uh, as you heard, he's got a little surprise for everyone. So that's about it. We'll see you for episode six whenever we feel like doing one. So thanks.